Um, today we're going to start about, we're going to talk about production audio for film, or as they like to say in Connecticut and Germany, the zen of microphones. Okay, it was a bad joke, My, I apologize. <laughs> a little bit of history about Sennheiser. Uh, we started in 1945, right at the end of World War II, June of 1945. Um, we're based in a little tiny village just north of Hanover, Germany, called Venabostel. And the village is about the size of this studio. It's that small. Um, Dr. Fritz Sennheiser, the founder of the company, was a uh, professor of electro electrical engineering at Hanover University. And during World War II, Hanover University basically got bombed into oblivion. He needed a gig, and so he uh, started out Sennheiser, uh, or Lab W, as it was originally called, um, uh, under contract making vacuum tube voltmeters for Siemens, which is basically the General Electric of Europe. And that was the first product that Sennheiser made. And in 1947, Siemens came to Sennheiser and said, we have this big contract for the new parliament in Germany, and we need all these microphones and can you build us these microphones? And Fritz said, well, you know, if you, can, if you can turn the windings to make a needle for a voltmeter, I'm sure we can make a microphone. And we did, and we've been in the microphone ever, business ever since. In 1957, we came out with our first wireless microphone. Get a load of the size of that lavalier. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, uh, this transmitter pack was literally, is literally about that tall and about that wide. And it used two 22 volt mercury batteries that lasted for about three and a half hours, which at that time was a record. Um, we have since gotten away from using mercury batteries in our transmitters. Something about the environment that people get all wound up about. Um, the big key to this microphone though was that it was the very first wireless microphone that had a legitimate range of 300 feet. And there were competitors who were in the wireless microphone business before us, but they didn't have a lot of success with it because of the very limited range, and they got out of it. We've been in the wireless microphone business since 1957 every day. A lot of our competitors came back in in the early 90s when the technology vastly improved and uh, it was a lot easier to make wireless microphones work. And then that's our receiver, which is about like that. It's a monster, and it receives two channels. <laughs> and those frequencies that it uses, you can see on the black bars here, are down below channel, TV channel 2. They're at 31 and 33 megahertz. And that frequency band is still available for use in wireless microphones. Nobody else is using it. It's still perfectly legal to use those frequencies. The problem is, is that you need an antenna that's about eight feet long. And getting people to wear eight feet of antenna is, is a little difficult. And so the antenna was actually built into the cable here. And so his microphone cable went clear down his torso and down the inside of his pants and came back up to the transmitter. So there, there were a few drawbacks to that, but that product lasted uh, until almost 1980. It had a heck of a run. So what's more important, picture or audio? Audio. audio. Mm -hmm. audio. Anybody care to disagree with this fine, outstanding gentleman over here? They say they're equally important. <laughs> okay, excellent answer. And you're absolutely right, they're both most important. No picture, why have audio? No audio, why have picture? Um, unless you're trying to do a silent movie and, you know, a remake of Metropolis, then we can talk. But even Metropolis had a music soundtrack to it, so there was still audio. So different types of microphones. There are lavaliers. You're probably familiar with that one. I'm wearing one right now with lots of clips and accessories available. Handheld microphones. Shotgun microphones. Anybody, do you, are you guys using Sennheiser shotguns here? 
Do you know? We have um, Sony Biodynamics and EV. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about shotguns because they're a critical component in uh, video production. Shotguns get used a lot, and shotguns don't get used enough. And there are some things that a lot of people don't understand about shotguns, which keeps them from using them effectively. And we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. And then there's wireless transmitters also. Well, that'll be the second part of the uh, discussion today. A little background, first off, uh, dynamic microphones. Anybody want to kind of give me an example of a dynamic microphone? A regular handheld microphone on a stage typically is a dynamic microphone. It was invented in 1828 by Siemens in Germany. It had a frequency response that was flat, I tell you flat, all the way from 200 to 350 hertz. It wasn't even the quality of a phone line. But it was the first dynamic microphone. It took sound waves and it made electricity. And that's basically what a dynamic microphone does is it takes sound waves that cause a diaphragm to vibrate up and down, and that via diaphragm is attached to a very lightweight coil of wire that's suspended around a magnet, and that creates electricity. Dynamic microphones are extremely useful in San Diego, California, because you have the Navy base here. And if you ever find yourself on an aircraft carrier shooting video and jets are taking off, leave all of your shotgun microphones home, leave all your good stuff home, and take dynamic microphones. Because the sound level is so high on the deck of a flat, of an aircraft carrier that you will blow up a uh, condenser or an electret microphone. But a dynamic microphone will actually take the abuse and handle it. A uh, great story about that is when before I went to work for Sennheiser, I worked for a dealer in Portland, Oregon, and I sold some Sennheiser shotguns to a customer of mine. And he calls up a week later and he says, one of these shotguns died during my shoot last week. <clears throat> oh, what? You know, usually Sennheiser shotguns just go out the door and they never come back. It's not a problem. And I said, okay, fluke of the universe, fine. I'll just get you a new one. We'll keep going. Sent his shotgun back to the service department at Sennheiser, and they said, capsule's blown. I'm like, huh? How do you do that? Okay, whatever. And they, you know, Sennheiser was nice. They, as a dealer, they sent me a new microphone. We replaced it. Everything was good. Two weeks later, he calls up again, and he says, both of my shotguns have died. And now I'm going, okay, wait a minute. What are you doing? Okay, tell me, what was going on at your shoot? Well, it turns out that he was at the drag strip and he was mounting these shotgun microphones on the Christmas tree right at the starting line. And these funny cars taking <laughs> off were at about 180 dB and just exploding the capsule and all the electronics in the, uh, in the shotgun microphones. I'm just like, dude, put a dynamic microphone there. It'll last and it'll sound better. So a different type of microphone is a condenser. This is a very high quality microphone. It's extremely accurate and it has a, very, has a relatively high level of output, okay? Typically, you see condensers used in studio microphones. Condensers get used quite a bit in shotgun microphones. They're a very, very good capsule. They're surprisingly rugged until you get up to about 140 dB, okay? 140 dB of sound is insane. It's insanely loud. So these will take a lot of noise. Okay, um, a really, really good loud trumpet player in a studio can hit about 135 dB, and that's insanely loud, and that's with a really high quality concert uh, trumpet. So condensers, basically, you have a back plate, which is at ground, and a front plate, which is at plus 48 volts, and as that front plate vibrates back and forth, uh, with the sound pressure, the distance between the two plates changes, and that causes a voltage change, and that's how the audio is, is derived from the microphone. Sounds really easy on paper, but in reality, it's very, very difficult. 
This front diaphragm here, uh, you may notice on my shirt it says Neumann. Sennheiser owns Neumann microphones. We build mi Neumann microphones in our factory in Germany, uh, in Vetemark. The uh, front plate of the uh, diaphragm is an extremely thin layer of mylar. It's three microns thick. The average human hair is about 85 microns thick. Just to give you a little exam, you know, a little comparison there. And on top of that, we then lay six microns of pure gold. That's 300 atoms, plus or minus six atoms. And somehow we have anal retentive German engineers who actually measure that <laughs> to make sure that it's correct. That's how thin those, uh, those diaphragms are. So frequency response defined by the range of sound from lowest to highest frequency. Everybody puts a lot of effort into frequency response. A lot of people actually think that frequency response means something. <coughs> Anybody want to take a shot on what it means? What's, what's this chart going to tell you compared to this chart? Anybody want to take a shot? Come on, you all haven't finished your lunch yet. You're not all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this chart down here, it's got some bumps up here in the high frequencies, around 4,000 and again at around uh, 10,000 hertz. And then it rolls off on the low end. Would you agree with that? OK. And this, this uh, frequency chart is extremely flat until it gets out to about 16,000 hertz and then it starts to roll off. Okay? Surprisingly, I, I'm going to admit this, but both of these are the same microphone. Okay? They're both the same microphone. One is on axis, the other is off axis. But I like to use this example because this is a good frequency response chart for a lavalier microphone because lavaliers typically get put on the chest, like mine is right now. And there's a lot of low frequency rumble in the chest, even in women. And so you have this really strong low frequencies in here. So you want a microphone that's going to roll them off so it comes out flat, so it sounds even. Also, these little bumps up here, this extra gain in the high frequencies, is good for enunciation. It allows you to tell the difference between T's, B's, P's, D's, okay? So you want that little high frequency bump up there. So a, a, a perfect microphone is not dead flat. If you listen to a microphone that's absolutely purely dead flat with no EQ in it, it just sounds dull and it sounds really lifeless. It just, it's like it's missing something, okay? So you don't necessarily want a microphone that's perfectly flat, and that's okay. But you need to know what that microphone's doing for the application you're using it for. So you don't want to take a lavalier microphone and hold it out at arm's length, because now you're going to be away from all of this low frequency rumble, and the, fr and the audio is going to sound thin and tinny, because all it's picking up is this stuff up here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Phew. <laughs> now, there are applications on, like on Broadway where you have to hide the microphone up on the head of the performer. And at that time, then all bets are out the window and you just have to EQ in the low end to make it sound natural, okay? Rule number one of audio. If it sounds good, you're doing it right. Rule number two. If it sounds bad, see rule number one. <laughs> okay? If it sounds bad, you're doing it wrong. There's no hard, fast rule. Okay? You, the goal, ultimately, is to position the microphone so that you get the highest quality audio possible until reality gets in the way and you have to move the microphone to accommodate the shot or you need to hide the microphone on the performer so that it doesn't show up like on Broadway or, some, or theater or something like that, okay? So 
you got to be flexible with audio. There's no really hard, fast rules. The stuff I'm going to talk about today, we're going to, it is a general guideline. Okay? It's kind of like you need to understand this, you need a place to start, and then you're just going to have to do things to accommodate the uh, production that's going on. Sensitivity of a microphone is defined as its electrical output level for a certain input level. Okay? So if I put, if I set up a microphone one meter away from a sound source that's putting out 100 dB of noise, that microphone is going to generate X number of millivolts of signal. Okay? That's sensitivity. A different microphone may give you Y volts, millivolts. You know, it'll give you a different number. It kind of gives you an idea of how to compare microphones in terms of sensitivity. But that's all it gives you, is an idea of how to compare microphones in terms of sensitivity. It doesn't tell you what the microphone's going to sound like. It doesn't tell you if that microphone is the right microphone for the application. It just tells you how sensitive it is, which is valuable in the factory, but once you get in the field, it's really, a wor it, it's really worthless. Now, something to keep in mind, in general, dynamic microphones are less sensitive than condenser microphones. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to run out and use a condenser every, on every shoot because the application may not be right. If you're out shooting in the weather, if you're out shooting you know, in the rain or something like that, or you're shooting down on the beach where there's a lot of salt spray, you probably want to use a dynamic microphone, even though it's a little less uh, sensitive, but it's going to be more robust for the weather conditions that you're in. It's going to, chances are it's going to last a little longer. Chances are that if you're in the salt spray and the microphone gets damaged, a dynamic microphone is going to be a lot cheaper to replace than a condenser. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that, that's also a factor. Pickup patterns, an omni is in all directions. Okay, front, back, left, right, up, down, all directions, it picks up sound to a degree. Omni microphones are not omni, and cardioid microphones are not directional. Okay, an omni microphone at a low frequency up to about 2,000 hertz will be omnidirectional in all directions. Above 2,000 hertz, it starts to become directional. Okay, so I'm wearing a la an Omni lavalier microphone right now. Don't mount this microphone upside down because at 6,000 hertz, which is where you can tell the difference between T's, B's, P's, D's, those enunciation consonants, okay, you're going to be on the blind side of the microphone. It's going to have become directional, so it'll be hard to tell. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, good. Uh, Omni applications, uh, a lapel microphone, very useful that way. Um, a plant microphone, that's where you take a microphone and you just plant it typically inside of a car. Okay, so in movies, TV shows where you see them driving down the, the road and it's obviously a chroma key behind them and it looks really cheesy. Right at the dash, they'll mount an Omni microphone in the dash outside of the shot to pick up the vocals for the uh, performers. Uh, tabletop microphone, interviews, recording studios. Uh, Omnis get used a lot on Broadway. Okay? The big advantage of an Omni microphone, especially with wireless microphones, is that as I move my head back and forth, the drop off of the signal is a lot less than if I was using a directional microphone. So this microphone's got to be going to be a lot more forgiving. If you're working with real seasoned professionals on television, if they're standing side by side and doing a stand up, you'll notice that they'll typically turn their entire torso towards each other when they're talking instead of just, you know, turning their head and getting an ear shot. Okay? And that's because they're trying to keep that microphone to keep their voice in the main pattern of the microphone. So that's what a cardioid looks like. Cardioid, it's Latin for heart.
cardio, okay? Basically, it's the shape of an upside down heart. So the back side of the microphone has very little gain. Very useful on a live stage, especially in a rock and roll show or something like that, where you got floor monitors making a lot of noise. You want a microphone that's going to be blind to its backside, okay? In a live production, like for a video production, you want to be able to get rid of the noise of our grip eating his, chi his chips at the back of the set, you know? So you want to use a directional mi handheld microphone for that. A football game, perfect example, where you want something that's kind of directional, that's rather directional, so that the person on the sidelines doing the stand-up, talking about what the coach just said at halftime, you know, you can get their voice into the microphone and kind of cut out some of the, uh, some of the uh, stadium noise, okay? That's a really good use for a cardioid microphone. They have good isolation. Unfortunately, due to the laws of physics, they're a little bit more prone to picking up handling and wind noise. And it's just darn laws of physics anyway. But we try to violate the laws of physics every day and we get our butts kicked for it. So ca cardioid applications, camera mount, um, lapel microphones in high ambient noise situations. Okay, going back to the football stadium would be a good, a good uh, uh, analogy there. Uh, overhead uh, boom with a low ceiling, live vocals, and instrument recording. Okay, typically uh, directional microphones get used a lot more in a recording studio than omnis do. So supercardioid pickup patterns. So a hypercardioid and a supercardioid are really good on stage when you have floor wedges positioned 45 degrees apart because there's a null right there to block out those, those floor wedges. Don't see these used a lot. They're out there. There's some good individual applications for them. Don't see them used very much at all in video production. The big one you see used in video production is the shotgun pattern, okay? What's the pattern? The shotgun pattern, now that I've already given it away, but shotguns have a big lobe off the back, okay? For you students in the room, don't be standing behind the camera talking about how much of a pain in the ass the prof is. He's going to hear it. <laughs> or she is going to hear it, okay? For those of you who work the, for, for you students who go out and become professionals, don't be standing behind the camera talking about how much of a pain in the ass the director is. You'll never get hired again, okay? This is, it's, we try and try and try to minimize this back lobe, and it's just the way shotgun microphones work, you can't do it. Um, my, shotgun microphones are extremely good at ignoring noise coming in from the sides. That's what they do really, really well. In a studio, uh, when I was working in recording studios, I like to use shotgun microphones on saxophones. And I'd have somebody standing here, and about six feet away, I'd put a shotgun microphone on the floor, pointed up at the bell of their saxophone. Got this great jazz, brassy sound that, instead of it going honk, 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 you could actually hear the instrument. But typically, right behind him would be the drum kit. Well, what's the microphone gonna pick up? The drum kit. So what I'd do is I'd take a crate and I'd put a big, soft, fuzzy throw from like Target with really long hair on it, big, fat, fuzzy one, and stuff it in that box and it would absorb this back lobe, okay? Now you can't put the microphone inside the box because as soon as you do that, when you put the microphone inside the box, you, the box will turn, turn the microphone into an Omni. Okay, do we have a handheld microphone around anywhere? Okay, <clears throat> and we'll come, we'll come back to that, why that happens. But it's, it's all about the airflow around the capsule. 
So supercardioid or shotgun applications, high ambient sound situations. Um, yes, I recommend that everybody go out and put a really expensive microphone on a boom and stand in the surf and shoot video. I really highly recommend that. Um, we need the sales, uh, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> This is not covered under warranty. Just to be clear, okay? It's not covered under warranty. Um, but overhead boom applications. Um, this is a pretty old picture. Shotguns were commonly used uh, to get the audio for weddings, but that's exceedingly unpopular now. Uh, honestly, the best, if you're shooting a wedding, Put a uh, omni micro. Put an omni lavalier on the uh, minister for the wedding, whoever the officiant is for the wedding, and it'll typically pick up the bride and the groom just fine. And that's the best way to do it. And then here's a really good example of a no-no. Don't do that. Okay. Anybody want to take a guess on why? Aside from it looks just butt ugly, okay. The capsule for a shotgun microphone is located just behind these cutouts, which are called the interference tube. So on this particular microphone, the capsule is going to be right about here where my fingers are. As soon as you put that tape around there like that, you've just altered the airflow around the microphone and you've just converted it into an omnidirectional mic. And it's going to pick up noise from all directions. Okay? So don't do that. When you put a mic into uh, a shotgun mount or a microphone mount on a camcorder and the mic is too long, okay, you need to move the mic back. Don't, don't slide the mic so that the, the collar is around any of the... Uh, ports on the interference tube, or you'll turn the microphone into an Omni, okay? Oh, thank you. And then anybody you see who grabs a microphone like that on stage, you have my permission to beat them senseless, okay? With the microphone, use a good microphone, a good heavy microphone, okay? You want lots of blood and hair and bone bits. <laughs> so what happens when you do that? What happens when you go Joe Rapper to the microphone? Squeal. Yes, it will squeal. Why? Again, you've turned the microphone into an Omni. Okay? You've also screwed up the airflow around the capsule. This thing is going to sound awful. It's going to sound about as bad as the microphone on my iPhone during a phone call, okay? So during live shows, when you see artists doing that, you'll see the monitor engineer just reach over and he'll just turn off all of the floor wedges on the front of the stage. It's like, too bad, dude. Put your hand where it belongs. I'll turn the monitors back up. But he has to control the feedback, okay? So you don't want stuff around here. Okay, now obviously a styrofoam, uh, not a styrofoam, but a foam, you know, windscreen on top is not going to alter the, wind the airflow that much to cut, change the pattern of the microphone. But when you do that, it really, really messes up the mic. Um, shotgun mics on cameras in front or side of stage. Uh, if you're ever doing a live performance event where your performers are wearing in-ear monitors, okay, and they've got these little ultimate ear guys plugged into their ears, you really need to put a couple of shotguns out on the front corners of the stage as pointed at the audience and feed a little bit of that audio back into their ears. Otherwise, they're so isolated, they can't hear the audience. They can't pick up any of that energy that the audience is screaming back at them, and their performance will vastly improve. See that a lot in theater now. A lot of performers in theater are wearing 
uh, in-ear monitors. Um, and they'll wear in-ear monitors so that they can hear what's going on on stage, but also they'll do it to get the cues. When they start to lose their lines, they'll get a cue via radio instead of having to look over there at the pit to see somebody trying to mouth the script lines for them. Uh, sound effects. Classic example of a sound effect done with a shotgun microphone is the noise that lightsabers make in Star Wars. That, that was done by taking a, 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 a sledgehammer out and holding a shotgun next to the guy wires on a radio tower and hitting the guy wire. And it would go And then the, that same sound was used when they would wave the lightsabers back and forth and the guy in the studio would stand while the noise was playing out of a speaker and he'd wave his shotgun microphone in front of the speaker. And it would go vroom, vroom. That's a great example of using shotgun microphones. Okay? Real creative uh, way to use a shotgun microphone too. So boom operator points. Um, always monitor your audio. That's what a novel concept. And everybody looks at me and says, uh, yeah, like, duh. But how many of you actually pack headphones with you everywhere you go? Okay. Invest in a good pair of professional headphones. And they're going to be closed back. Okay. And the reason why you want a closed back pair of headphones is so that you get sound isolation from the noise that's around you. Because professional headphones will allow you to hear the problem you're trying to find. If your so-called professional headphones say beats on them, please try again. Okay, those are consumer headphones. They are EQ'd and they are built to sound good with MP3s, with your phone, that sort of stuff. Okay, they're designed to be enjoyable to listen to. Professional headphones are not designed to be enjoyable to listen to. You're listening for problems, okay? These, these headphones that I carry, I may be a little bit biased on them because they say Sennheiser on them, but I can actually hear the D to A converter working in my laptop with these headphones, okay? So I know what that sound is. I know what it is. I can say, okay, I can ignore that and move on and listen for other problems. But that's what professional headphones are for is to listen to problems. You want to plug in before you start rolling tape. God, that's, is that an old term or what? <laughs> but you want to plug in and you want to listen to the audio coming from your performers on set or on stage. Make sure that it's clean. If you're hearing some little interference noises, it's a lot easier to fix it now, and it's a lot better to fix it now than it is to try to figure out how you're going to mask that in post because chances are you're not. And once you got crappy audio, you're stuck with crappy audio. So always monitor your audio. Um, for professional headphones, Sony's HDR 7000 series, the 7506s, 7509s are great headphones. Shure's 400 series are good professional headphones. I'm gonna be getting a memo from the, uh, my boss for having said that, but oh well. AKG makes some nice ones. Um, Audio-Technica, they're real high-end, closed-back uh, headphones, are good professional headphones. Um, so there are a number of them out there. The pair of headphones you buy, listen to them intently for about two weeks. I mean, listen to them a lot so that your brain learns how your headphones sound. And then, to be honest with you, you will be stuck with that model of headphones for the rest of your life, okay? Because your brain is trained to know how those headphones sound. And that'll allow you to, to, to hear problems, diagnose problems, and fix them a lot faster down the road. So um, I love the HD 380s. I work with a lot of people who use the Sony 7509s and 7506s. They love them. They, you know, there's no way they would ever change. And I would never try to change them because their brain is trained to how those headphones sound. And I could spend the rest of the day talking about headphones. 
but I'll save you the grief. Um, you got to work with smooth bone mo movement, and here's the most important thing. You got to know the script. Okay, you really need to spend some time with your director and know what the script is because you got to keep that thingy out of that thingy's view. Okay, you don't want the microphone in the shot. And a great trick for keeping the microphone out of the shot is you don't have to put the microphone above pointing down. You can take that boom and you can put it in low, point it up. And it'll pick up the shot, it'll pick up the sound just as well. Okay? So depending upon the shot, maybe you want to go in low. And also, I don't know about you, but my shoulders don't get nearly as tired standing like this. <laughs> as opposed to standing like this for an extended period of time. Um, work with your videographer because you, you don't want yourself showing up in the mirror <laughs> in the shot. That's a little embarrassing. And you got to be aware of the shadows. So that's a real advantage of putting the shotgun down low and pointed up is it's out of the shadows. It doesn't create shadows. That said, uh, how many of you have watched uh, on Netflix House of Cards? Cool show, isn't it? That's done with three cameras locked down. There's nobody at the camera. The cameras never get moved during a scene. And they're shooting it all in 8K, and then they're cutting it down to 1920 by 1080 windows. And they, in post, they actually do the pans and the camera movements in post. Okay? And the boom operator actually has his mic in the shot. And what they do is before they start, before any actors come on set, they've positioned all three cameras where they want them, and then they take a shot of the set fully lit, and then they bring everybody on, and that shot of the set is used so that you can paste out the shotgun microphone. And they're doing that in post. They're crazy, but. <laughs> Is that just so they can get optimal sound? Yep. Don't have to worry about where it's all going. about the optimal sound, and they're tr what they're trying to do is they don't want the actors wearing microphones because it changes their performance. And they really want the actors to perform like the actors are on stage. And to get that audio quality, you have to get that boom microphone, that shotgun microphone, in close. And so they have to, they have to cut and paste and remove it in post. So uh, continuing the booming and wind protection, um, anytime you're shooting with a shotgun outdoors, you need to use a Zeppelin and a, what's called officially a wind jammer, what everybody in the business calls a dead cat. <laughs> Hand me that dead cat. Well, yeah, it's getting breezy out here. Um, and then indoors, at least use a foam windscreen. Very, very rarely you will use a shotgun microphone bare like this. Okay? There are a couple of voiceover guys in LA that will use a shotgun microphone in their booth uh, doing voiceover work, and they'll mount the shotgun up like this and it'll be bare, but they have incredible voice control. You know, so they're not the norm. Um, so, Keep a, keep a screen on, the, on a shotgun microphone. It's just too sensitive, typically. Microphone pre preferences for dialogue. First choice, shotgun with a boom operator. First choice doesn't usually have budget for that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, secondly, a plant mic, a uh, lavalier in a car, you know, that sort of stuff. Lavalier, hardwired or wireless. Okay, in our second presentation today, we'll talk about wireless microphones, how to use them. First questions you got to ask, and hopefully some of you can stay for the second part, but the first question you need to ask yourself if you're going to use wireless microphones is, do I need to use a wireless microphone? Okay, we build tons of wireless microphones, but wireless microphones are a heck of a lot less reliable than wired microphones. So there's more things to go wrong. 
You don't want more things going wrong on your shoot. So do I need to use a wireless microphone? Is it required? Okay, if, the, if your person's sitting at a desk, if your person's standing there not moving at all, you know, and if it's not a full body shot, why use a wireless microphone on them? Okay, if they're moving around, then yes, obviously you need to use a wireless microphone. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Uh, speaking of wireless microphones, batteries. Batteries are a good thing. Check them. They're cheap. Just saying. It's never happened to me. I've never had a wireless microphone die on a shoot. Um, I read about it on the internet. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> uh, last choice is the shotgun on your camera. Why is that? Distance. Okay. If we put this shotgun on that camera in the back of the room, it's just going to be too far away from me and it's going to start picking up the air conditioning ducts and the noise of the lights and people breathing in the room. It's just going to, it's just going to pick that stuff up. Okay, so when you're setting up for a shoot, you need to listen for what is making noises in the room. What are the mechanical noises? We'll stop here for a second and what are the mechanical noises you hear in this room? Mm -hmm. You hear people out in the hallway? You hear the cooling fans on this screen? Okay. So those are things to be aware of. Okay. Let's say that there are no cooling fans on this screen, just because that complicates the issue. And what we hear is the HVAC. Where are you going to position your shotgun to ignore that HVAC sound? No, oh, but what about that lobe off the back that's pointed at the HVAC now? Where does a shotgun have its most resistance to sound? Where is its? Sideways. There you go. Mount the shotgun sideways. Nothing says that the shotgun has to be mounted on a boom up above. You can put it, the shotgun right here, and you'll get probably even better pickup and it's ignoring that HVAC sound. It's also ignoring the sound coming, bouncing up off the floor. Off of a hard tile floor, sound is going to bounce off of that. So sometimes, if it's a stationary shot, you just want to put a little throw rug, a nice soft throw rug on the floor underneath the microphone, just to help kind of absorb some of that sound. <clears throat> so location scouting. And anybody got the time right now? 109. 109. Okay, some of you got to get out of here. Do you guys? Okay, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. You bet. Because the last thing you guys need to do is be still sitting here at 3 o'clock going, hey, come on, man. <laughs> Okay, so now we're down to the hard cores. Um, on your location sh scouting, invite the production sound mixer. Take your audio guy with you, okay? It's gonna make your day a lot easier. If you're the audio guy, volunteer to go, on the, to go scout the location, okay? Sound mixer is usually not invited, which is a serious bummer. And something we just talked about, look and listen, okay? You need to look around, you need to listen. If you're shooting outside, what's nearby? Construction sites, okay? So if we were to go outside right out here between this building and the student union, okay? There's a big construction site going on, okay? That could affect audio quality, couldn't it? It could have a negative impact, might we say. Um, airports, playgrounds, subways, daycare centers, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, you guys picked up the HVAC running in here, which is good. I'm glad that the HVAC is running, but I would be working around it if I was doing a shoot in here. Uh, ceiling height, elevator noise. Now, what happens with ceiling height? 
okay? In here, in this area, we've got a fairly absorptive uh, suspended ceiling. It actually does a surprisingly good job of absorbing the sound. But if we go on the other side of the curtain, you just have the poured concrete, okay? Sound is gonna bounce off a bit, big time. And it's hard to learn how to listen for that because the human brain is extremely good at filtering out noises it doesn't want to hear. So how do you filter out those noises you don't want to hear? Close your eyes. Because if you can't see the lips moving, the brain doesn't know what to focus on, and it starts hearing everything that a microphone's going to hear. Okay, so little trick, just close your eyes. And then your brain gets all confused and it starts hearing everything. And then, you know, how close can you set up to the action that's being shot? It's going to affect your microphone positioning. And read the script. Uh, hopefully there is a script. I've never worked on a shoot without a script. I don't know about you. Yeah, right. I shot news. I know what it's like. Um, and communication is the key. Ask questions. You know, work with the rest of your crew to, to understand what they're trying to work with, what you, what you need, you know, and everybody can come together. It's a lot easier to do that over a pitcher of beer two days before the shoot than it is during the shoot when it's all going wrong. Lavalier microphones. Um, little trick with mo lavalier microphones, they're really designed to go on the chest, okay? Um, these are rather large, it's a rather old photo, but a good rule of thumb is this notch in your collarbone, three fingers down, and then the bottom of your sternum, three fingers up, that space between my hands, that's the sweet spot, okay? Everything's fine and lovely and wonderful until you start working with a female performer who's wearing nothing, basically. And then all the rules are out and you gotta figure out how to hide this microphone on her someplace. <laughs> um, that brings us back to communication is key. Don't just assume that you can go putting the microphone anywhere you want to on her. She might get a little annoyed with you. However, on women as opposed to men, because of the difference in their muscle structure, this area right here is actually a divot on women where on men there's, there's a whole bunch of muscle right here and the chest sticks out. But on women it actually is a little concave and that's a great place to hide the microphone with a little bit of um, removable tape, okay? Don't use electrical tape, don't use gaffer's tape. She will kill you when you try to remove that from her. And stickies, stickies, stickies are our friend, okay? You should have lots of these. Thank you. Um, they do wonders for helping you attach whatever you need to attach. Um, worked with uh, a company up in Hollywood. They were shooting the uh, typical psychotic reality show with 20-something young females who were being less than reasonable emotionally, shall we say, and, wear, and basically wearing very tiny, small string bikinis. And so hiding the microphones on them became really, really difficult. And what we did was we typically ended up bringing the microphone just in front of her ear and using a skin-toned microphone. And that's where we'd mic mount the microphone and then bring it back in her hair and run the mic cable down her back. And then a very small wireless mic kit, about, about half the size of the one I'm wearing, would go on her bikini. Everything was fine and wonderful until she got pissed off and either jumped into the swimming pool or got thrown into the swimming pool. We were totally good with that happening because that transmitter was $3,000 a whack and they went through about 20 of them. <laughs> we liked that show. So fix the clip on mics properly. <coughs> um, why do you put a loop in here? Why not just run the mic straight up? Isolation. Mm -hmm. What kind of isolation? Uh, 
Okay. If you just have a straight cable going down there, as the cable rubs against the clothing, my skin, whatever, it creates micro, what's called microphonics, sound waves that travel on the surface of the uh, cable. And they'll go right into the microphone. If you put a little loop in here, those sound waves can't make the corner and they die. Okay, so it keeps your microphone quiet. Cuts way down on that cloth rustle and that sort of stuff. So this is really important to have this loop. If you can have a, if you can have a double loop like this one, it's even better than the half loop that I have right now, but this, this is better than no loop, okay? So you always want to figure out some way to get a loop in there, okay? And it's just to get sound isolation. And then you would do the same thing on a tie, and this cable comes back behind and does a loop behind the tie here and then heads on down. Just like that, see? I wasn't making it up as I go. Now here's, here's where all the rules go out the door when you go to Broadway. 90% of the Broadway stages in New York are Sennheiser uh, houses. And this microphone capsule right here is three millimeters in diameter. That's an eighth of an inch. It's really, really small. And then the cable itself has the microphone conductors inside of it. The jacket is made out of Kevlar, and then the whole thing is coated in Teflon. You guys need to own lots of them. They're really, really cool. But this gives you the ability to ha hide the microphone right up here at the hairline. Gives you the ability to hide the microphone in the hair back by the ear, okay? A Couple of advantages of putting the microphones on the head is that no matter how the head moves around, the microphone never changes in relationship to the mouth, okay? So the audio pickup is always the same. And you can just eat, you know, as we were talking earlier, when you get the, the lavalier off of the chest, you know, it's low end frequency response is gonna really drop off, but you can EQ that back in in the board. <clears throat> and that's where we hid the microphone for uh, Shrek, was in the latex nose piece. It worked very nicely. So wireless microphones, do I really need to use it? That's a legit question, okay? Don't use a wireless microphone just simply because it's convenient. It's what I always do, okay? If you can use a wired microphone, use a wired microphone. Okay, what's the shot? Wide, narrow, how many cameras? Uh, where will be the talent be located? Are they moving? Okay, if your talent is gonna be moving around like I am, obviously, duh, wireless microphone. Okay, we could do me, you know, we, we could set me up on a, a wired lavalier, get phenomenal results. It would be a little inconvenient for me, but I could get a buy with it. The shots don't have my feet in there. I could probably be okay. We made television news for years and years and years and decades using wired lavaliers. Nothing says we can't go back to it. Um, and then as we were talking earlier, what will they be wearing? Okay, the less they're wearing, the harder it is to use a wired lavalier. And in television today, there seems to be um, a lot less material involved in the costumes, shall we say. Um, now, what's the location of the production? Okay, here in San Diego, it can be really, really tough to go down on the waterfront and use a wireless microphone. Okay, the US Navy likes to pollute everything from DC to light when it comes to RF. They can just make it unbelievably difficult. Um, so a military base, is always very difficult. Airports are very difficult too. Very hard to shoot near an airport with wireless microphones. They'll typically get swamped by the radar. And then if you're in Times Square in New York City, forget it, pal. It's just, <laughs> although I would rather try to get a frequency in Times Square than anywhere in LA. LA is just the most miserable, 
awful place to get a wireless mic frequency. Um, are there other transmitters being used on set? Okay, if there are, you need to start getting into frequency coordination, which is a really nice transition because we're about to go there. So level settings, okay? We put in a fresh set of batteries uh, when we started this presentation. And then as soon as that was done, the first thing I did was I set uh, sensitivity on the transmitter. You wanna set the sensitivity on the transmitter with your talent so that modulation is averaging between 50 and 75%. Peaks above 75 are okay, occasionally, but most, most of the modulation level needs to be between 50 and 75%. And then you'll get nice clean audio that won't be distorted, okay? But first thing to do is check your batteries. Turn on your receiver first and look to see if it's picking up any signals. If it is, change frequencies, okay? Don't, don't turn on your transmitter and, and then turn on your receiver because if they're both on the same frequency, the, you know, the receiver is just going to get a ton of signal and you're going to go, ah, this is great, cool, let's go. Well, you don't know that, you know, the other side of that curtain, there may be a transmitter on the same frequency also. Uh, always set audio level at the transmitter first. You want to get that modulation level between 50 and 75% on, on average. And then you can adjust the output level of your receiver so that it's sending a good solid signal into the, cam, into the camera and not uh, uh, over modulating or under modulating. And then use your ears. Plug in a pair of headphones into the camera and listen to the entire chain and make sure it's clean all the way through. Doesn't take very long. You just, it takes maybe seven, eight seconds is all. And you'll know if it's good and solid. And then is there distortion noise? Where's, you know, if you're getting some distortion, where's it coming from? We'll talk about that. And then perform a walk test. If your talent is going to be moving around on the stage or moving around on the set, typically more like a stage or if you're doing an outdoor shoot, walk that area before the production starts, okay? Walk that entire area and make sure you're getting good, solid signals from your wireless microphones everywhere in, on, on, that, on that shoot. You don't want to be having to tell your, your client that or your talent Okay, stop. Uh, we just had a drop out there. Um, uh, you know, let me re-engineer the entire wireless system to make it work. You know, they get a little cranky with that. Plus, you're now wasting everybody's money, everybody's time. <clears throat> so, body pack transmitter and receiver antennas. Uh, IEM. Does everybody know what IEM stands for? Everybody know what IFB stands for? Okay, IEM is in-ear monitor. IFB is intercom foldback. The only difference between the two is the audio that you put into it. IFB will have, direct, will have the director in your ear. IEM will have program audio in your ear. Okay, so... <coughs> Um, live performers, uh, I saw that Janet Jackson is coming to San Diego State. She will, she will be wearing in-ears. Hers will be an IEM because she will be listening to the band mix and her vocals and the audience coming back in, okay? Go down to a local TV station and the anchor presenting the news this evening will be listening to directions from the, dire from the director and the producer. That's what she or he will be hearing in their ear. The, that's the only difference between the two. There is no such thing as an IFB transmitter being different from an IEM transmitter. They're both the same. Once you get to RF, they're identical. It's just how you use them. So we got our little whip antenna hanging out. And in the UHF band, uh, this lambda signal stands for wavelength. 
In UHF, a wavelength is about two feet long, okay? So a quarter of a wavelength is about six inches. That's all you need. You need about six inches of antenna sticking out. And then inside the transmitter or the receiver is another six inches of wire and you get a half wave antenna. So let's talk about body absorption for a minute, okay? If you're doing a video production shoot, if there's any way possible to put the transmitter on the hip, okay, do it. Everybody just kind of assumes that it all goes in the back, okay? Um, but if you have typically a male talent who's wearing a sports jacket or a blazer or something, you can hide all this inside on the hip. If you're working with a female talent, who's wearing a really tight dress, um, plan B is called for. <laughs> Typically, she will be a lot shorter than me. And so you can run the cable all the way down the inside of her dress and you can put an elastic band just underneath her knee. Or if she's wearing a pair of boots, clip it to the top of her boots. Great location. But if you can get this antenna, it's here someplace. If you can get this antenna, to see that antenna physically, you'll get much, much better reception. Also, did everybody see what I did to the receiver antenna when we started? It was originally pointed the same direction as the lens. And I took the receiver and I turned it sideways. Why? You get more coverage. Exactly. How much, how much finger do you see there? You see very little finger if you're looking right on the end of my finger. Now, how much finger do you see? Same thing with an antenna, okay? If I put this transmitter on my back, you're gonna get 26 dB of signal loss. 20 dB is 99.9% .9 of the signal, okay? So you've lost almost all of the signal just going through the body, and then, if the receiver antenna is pointed like this, you're going to lose another 20 dB right there, okay? Because it has so little surface area to pick up the signal. So you're basically asking for complete and total disaster because you've lost 99.999% of the signal, okay? And these poor little transmitters are only putting out 0 0.03 watts to begin with. So there's not a lot there to work with. So everything you can do to help improve the electrons getting from here to there is worth its weight in gold. So is more RF power better? Not necessarily, okay? If you're, if you're standing up, if your shot is up at the top of a canyon and your talent is down in the bottom of the canyon, then yeah, you want to be up at 100 milliwatts because you got a long distance to go, okay? But if you have 60 or 90 wireless microphones on stage all at once on Broadway, you want everybody down at 10 milliwatts, okay? The more microphones you bring on, the less power you actually want to have because every microphone, every wireless transmitter is going to increase the noise floor. And if they're putting out more power, the noise floor comes up even faster. So you want to keep them low power. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it's really important. So intermodulation or intermod or harmonics, sprogs, birdies, tweets, nasties. This happens when you get more than two wireless microphones working at once, okay? Anybody ever run into this problem? Yeah, why? Because we only had uh, one receiver set up and uh, Oops. the other mic was turned on when they were supposed to turn on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, interference, yeah. yeah. Uh, intermodulation, uh, if you guys want to get out your legal pad and write all this down so that you can do it all by hand. Um, I'm totally good with that. So for two transmitters, 
you take frequency 1, multiply it by 2, and then subtract frequency 2. And then you take frequency 2, multiply it by 2, and subtract frequency 1. So here we have this whole chart. So frequency 1 is at 520. Frequency 2 is at 523. The second harmonic is just adding those two frequencies together, and it's up at 1043. It's way, way out of our band. We're not even worried about the second harmonic. But the third harmonic and the fifth harmonics can be very critical, can be very important, okay? So if I'm using 520.125, 523.5, I cannot use 516.750 or 526.875, okay? So you can do all the math by hand to figure this out, okay? Uh, earlier this week, I was in Las Vegas at, with the Blue Man Group. They're moving into a new theater at the Luxor Casino, which is that black pyramid thing. And I was setting up 28 channels. Okay, so imagine getting out to 2 times F28 minus F1 minus F2 minus F, you know, doing that all by hand's a nightmare. Okay. Um, there are wonderful programs that will do all of those calculations for you. But you've got to understand what's going on. Any musicians in here? Cool. Okay, so let's say you walk up to a piano and you hit A, B. Sounds okay. It sounds all right. What happens if you hit A, B, C? You just kind of cringe a little, don't you? It's not really a great chord at all. Why is that? Um, because they're not forming a chord, or they're too close to one another? They're linearly spaced. Mm -hmm. They're equally spaced across from each other. If you hit A, B, D, mm -hmm. that's going to sound still not great, but it'll sound better, mm -hmm. okay? Because now they're not equally spaced. So their harmonics are not interfering on top of each other, okay? So if you hit A, B, C, A and C combine, and cancel out uh, B. A and B combine and cancel out C. C and B combine and cancel out A. And so you just end up with this mess going on. And we'll show you that in just a second here. So there's F1, and there's F2. And so, what the heck happened there? Oh well, we're about to show you the same thing. Okay. So we got our two transmitters on here, on our frequencies. And they are going to create intermodulation. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. They will create intermodulation. And notice that intermodulation will be exactly half the power of your two primary frequencies. OK? That will be enough signal that if you were to put another transmitter of 526.875, this would cause interference. It would sound awful. And then we also get a lower third going on there. And then we get out to fifths. Typically, a fifth, an intermodulation fifth, is not a problem to worry about unless you have a whole ton of transmitters and everybody's really, really close together, or you have one person who's wearing a whole bunch of transmitters. We had this happen with Shania Twain, who her waist is about that big around. She's just a tiny little thing. But she had a body pack transmitter for her vocals, a body pack transmitter for guitar, a body pack transmitter for um, violin, and then she had her in-ear monitor. And it was clear across her entire back. And it was an RF nightmare. And she was wondering why her in-ear monitors wouldn't work. Well, because this poor receiver has got all these transmitters next to it, and it's just getting killed. <clears throat> so let's say that you want to set up 20 wireless channels. OK? There's my 20 wireless channels over 2,000 intermod frequencies will be bad just setting up those 20 channels. <laughs> so imagine setting up 28 channels 
with three other theaters nearby, which was what I was doing earlier this week. So you need to find out if there are existing wireless mic systems in the install. Is there wireless intercom going on? You'll typically see this more in theaters. Don't see a lot of wireless intercom in TV stations, but see it commonly used in theaters. Find out whose brand it is and find out what frequencies they're using. Um, most wireless intercom has gotten out of the UHF band, which is where most wireless is, um, but you still need to find out. And the house is typically more than happy to tell you what frequencies they're using because they don't want you stepping on them either. So um, wireless inter IFB, Electrosonics, Sennheiser, Shure. Um, with Electrosonics, you need to find out what model uh, of uh, IFB transmitter they're using or uh, IEM transmitter because their model T1 is a quarter of a watt, 250 milliwatts. The maximum that Sennheiser does is 100 milliwatts and you have to have a license for that. So typically it's 25 or 30 milliwatts. Don't see a lot of Vega. Uh, see quite a bit of Williams sound, but not in the uh, UHF band anymore. Video transmitters are a nightmare. They're just an absolute nightmare. Find out where they are, what they're using, and what frequencies they're on, because they'll kill you. They will just flat kill you. And two-way ra two radios are painful. Uh, at the Oscars earlier this year, we had to coordinate over 300 channels, including two-way radios for security. And all of those guys were running at five watts. And, you know, pick an actress. Her security people wanted seven channels of wireless. And the next actor wanted another seven channels. You know, and so it just goes on and on and on. And then we get clear down to the end, and it's like, um, you know, we got Taylor Swift on stage, and she needs a wireless microphone, and we need a frequency. What do you got? You know, <laughs> so you got to back up and start all over again. What's the location of other wireless systems? Are you in the same room, adjacent, other side of the building? If you're on the other side of the building, that can help a lot. Distance is your friend. So can concrete can be your friend. Steel can be your friend. Concrete and steel can also be your enemy. Okay, because you might want to, you might want to get the audio from a person on the other side of that door there as they walk into the set. Well, that's that wall's concrete, and the signal went away. So that can be painful. So wireless setups. Basically, it's really easy. You just put audio into the transmitter and get audio back out the other end. Am I, am I done for time? Uh, well, if we're going to do the second one, we should, we should. We're already on the second one. Oh, we are? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got to 109, and I threw people out. Good. So does that change everything? Or? No, we have about 15 minutes. Okay, cool. So things that really affect you are transmitter power and the antenna, okay? There's not a lot you can do about the transmitter power. I mean, it's a, it's a transmitter you got. And typically, they don't change. There's not, until you get into the really high-end ones, you're not gonna be able to change power levels. This particular model, which is actually about that tall, and there's a single AA battery in here, is all. You can switch it between 10 milliwatts and 30 milliwatts, but uh, this, the pack I'm wearing today, it's fixed at 30 milliwatts. Diversity antennas. Okay, let's talk about diversity antennas and then I'll stop making your uh, eyes bleed because now we're talking about companding and we're just gonna basically skip over that. So in companding, the transmitter starting at about 1500 hertz and up the transmitter exaggerates that sound. And what, that, what that's d it's done is to minimize the amount of noise that you'll hear. Okay, so we're masking noise in the FM world there. And then in the receiver, starting at that same frequency response, it has less and less response to high frequencies 
And so if they're perfectly balanced, it'll all balance out. Just like listening to an FM broadcast radio station. Same thing is done there. So low modulation equals a high noise floor. Okay, if you've set your sensitivity on your transmitter too low, it's gonna be down here in the noise and it's gonna sound like crap. That's a technical term, I used it in a sentence. It's gonna sound like crap. So adjust the input sensitivity so that you're getting between 50 and 75% modulation and whatever number that is, fine. Come on, beast. So diversity. Okay. So aside from it being a uh, politically correct term, diversity in uh, RF is a much different term. And so if your transmitter has a direct signal to the receiver, okay, it's not a problem. One in 10 on the transmitter, one in 10 on the receiver, life is good, okay? And you get this nice big signal. Unfortunately, that doesn't typically happen. This is what typically happens. So in here, the signal off of my transmitter may be bouncing off that window and coming over and causing interference on the uh, receiver on the camera, okay? So what you need is a second antenna. You get phase cancellation because of that problem on the one antenna. What we do on camera mount uh, receivers is that cable that runs out with the XLR cable on it, we use the shield of that cable as a second antenna, okay? So now where we were getting a signal bouncing off of the wall here and coming over and causing cancellation on antenna A, now with antenna B we can just get a direct signal. And then the receiver will say, oh, well, the signal's much better here on B, and it'll switch automatically. So there are a number of ways of doing diversity reception. One is just take two antennas and measure the voltage on the antennas, and whichever antenna has the most voltage, just assume that that's the best signal. Okay? That's all fine and dandy until this is perfectly spaced so that those two signals arriving on antenna A actually add instead of subtract. Oops! The second way is to measure the phase difference between antenna A and antenna B, the same signal arriving at antenna, at each antenna, how, how out of phase are they, okay? That's a bit more accurate way to determine which signal is better. The most accurate way to determine which signal is the best is to actually put a complete receiver on antenna A and a complete receiver on antenna B, and then when it gets clear down to the audio, measure that audio and determine which audio is most accurate, and then switch there. That's called true diversity. That's how Sennheiser does it. That's why our stuff is not cheap, because, well, it works. So why diversity? Uh, here's a perfect example. The dark red line shows us where we switched between antenna A and antenna B during that shoot. And in non-diversity, okay, antenna B, okay, that's the signal you wanted to use there, but if you're locked, you know, you've kept that in a, in a 10 dB range, but look what happened during the shoot on antenna A. You had this huge signal dropout, okay? So you want to maintain as high a signal as possible, you know, within reason. So an omnidirectional antenna, omnidirectional antennas are not omnidirectional. They don't go everywhere. So if you have this paddle antenna here, let's say that this is the paddle antenna, it does not receive off the top or off the bottom. So it's more like a big bagel, okay? The technical term for that is a toroidal pattern. But they only work off the sides. They don't work off the ends. And I can't tell you how many TV studios I've walked into and omni paddles are mounted up in the 
uh, light, pan, light grid and the end of the paddles pointed straight down at the, the talent. And it's like, dude, what are you doing, man? So little, little reality check there. Directional antennas have about a 4 dB gain off the front and a 10 dB loss off the back, okay? Perfect example, Marconi Center up in San Francisco. They were having terrible problems with all those TV signals coming off of Sutro Tower, just beating them up big time. And all we had to do was move the antennas so that the back side of these antennas was pointed towards Mount Sutro. Okay? So sometimes you really want to use the null side or the back side of the antenna to cancel out those frequencies you don't want interfering with you, those signals that you don't want to have interfering with you. Does that make sense? Okay? Omni paddles are a really good example of if you're getting interference from a TV station here, take the tip of the paddle and point it towards the TV station so that it won't pick up that signal. And then your wireless mic will work better. So that's, you know, an example of uh, on stage using them. No, you don't have to mount the Sennheiser transmitter uh, antenna upside down over on the left, but that's okay. Um, so uh, squelch setting. Anybody know what squelch is? You guys, you guys are just way too quiet. Okay. In FM, because FM transmitters put out a constant amount of power, in FM, you can say that at X amount of voltage, I want the receiver to assume that this is a valid signal and to start decoding it. And if that signal strength drops below a certain level, then I want you to say, it's too weak, don't try to receive it, mute, okay? And that's what squelch is, that's all squelch is. So we've got our noise floor down here that looks like a lawn that needs to be mowed. And we've got our happy little wireless transmitter carrier right there. And we've decided that 10 microvolts is where we want to have our squelch level set. And so as long as our happy little wireless mic carrier is more than 10 millivolts, the receiver will try to decode it. And we'll lock on it and life will be good. So another way that we work with pilot tone is to use what's called, with squelch rather, is to use what's called pilot tone. And it's basically like a stereo carrier on an FM radio station that makes your little stereo light turn on. Those of us who are really old remember those days, don't we? <laughs> and so what we do is uh, at Sennheiser, we put out a frequency that's at about 32,000 hertz. So it's way out of the audible range. And as long as the receiver can, can detect this 32 kilohertz tone, it will say, oh, that's a, Sen that's a signal from a Sennheiser transmitter. I know what to do with that. I'm going to decode it, okay? So if you have another brand of transmitter in the room that doesn't use this same frequency, your receiver will say, you're not a valid signal. I'm not to, going to decode. And then typically we see that when you get far enough away that the receiver can't pick up this 32K tone anymore, your signal's down here, down there anyway. So it needs to squelch. Thank you for having me.